So I guess as a brief. Which basically just summarises the sites, but I've also included what app soils were used, how much water was in each soil, what met stations we've used and where they were. This is more so that we can repeat anything that we uh, might need to do, but also so that you guys have a good record and say, you know, if something changes or you're more interested in looking at something else, we can quickly get back to it. It's also a good way that Elizabeth and I use to uh, keep ourselves on track and that way if um, or something Elizabeth will know exactly where to go and can answer your questions. So this was the sheet that we all worked on and with a range of rotations that came up with. I think there's 20 there. Um, this is the same sheet with her that continually got doctored until we were satisfied with what we wanted. Um, and these were the sewing rules that we used for the most of the rotations. So the main thing to remember in this is that we, for all of the rotations, we used a, a must sew rule, which basically means track. So even if the rules weren't met, it did sow a crop, but it sowed it on the very last day of the rotation. So if you start to, when I think Bill asked the question earlier, how could, um, you know, if we've got different starting conditions, different starting water rules, how do you, how do they play out if you have to sow anyway? The difference is if you, um, have a very high trigger, it may take, and if it's not met, it will always sow at the very end of the window, where a more aggressive trigger will sow earlier, and therefore you're getting it in at a more opportune time. So the main, the timing of when things are sowing. I guess as a next step is for some of the crops, we can start saying that if they can't be sown, we'll skip skip them and they just become a fallow. Gets a little bit messy when you're jumping between summer and winter because um, it will still follow the same loop uh, where if you were in reality, let's say you couldn't plant a sorghum crop, you'd probably want to plant a wheat crop with afterwards if you had enough water, where this system at the moment you would come all the way around and plant the soil, you know, you, everything stays in order. So you would sorghum crop. There are ways around that and I, we've done it for a few uh, uh, different crops. Are you guys getting my sound fairly clearly? Because occasionally I'm seeing you dropping in and out on the screen. If that's, a, if that's an issue, I will turn my camera off, which might speed things up a bit. Yeah, it is in and out a little bit, but it's not too bad. Okay, I will just stop my video. That might just give a little bit more bandwidth to um, can find where myself is. Uh, maybe I won't stop it. <laughs> Looks too tricky. I'll just plug on. All right. So please interrupt with any questions. Um, this is probably the most interesting bit for some of you, for, for, you, for Bill and Pete. These were the costs and prices that we used. Um, I do have some concerns with cotton because I think that price is including lint, is for lint and seed. But at the moment we've found uh, the, the model will only put out a lint product. Um, it's actually having a slight error. I'm having to do a correction of it, 
which we've got the guys trying to fix. It was a, a bug we found in the model. But um, so cotton doesn't, it, it may look a little better than what it does in some of the outputs because it is only a lint. Well, I think, I don't know, you guys would know better than me. Does that price look like a lint price or a lint and seed price? I'd say lint and seed by the look of that because, you know, your lint price is usually, oh, hang on. So if you're talking $500 a bale, bales are 225 so that price is probably quite low, really. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, that it was a low price. Yeah, yeah that, um, that worked out at nearly, at only sort of $250 a bale. I didn't pick that up before, sorry. So if we're working on a yeah. tonnage rate, it's probably closer to 450 a bale, which makes it 1800 Yeah, okay. So we can run it again with that. Um, because when you look through those, yeah, when you look through those rotations, anything with cotton seems to be pulled down a bit in terms yeah. of gross yeah. money. Maybe that's the explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I may try and be really smart and rerun it while we're talking, and we can have a look at um, the prices. I'll see how difficult that gets. It um, it may just end in a mess. Got too many screens here. I'm now looking at a third one. Right. Anyway, um, let's have a look at what we came up with. So you guys have both looked at this document. things that I noticed in it is it it definitely does focus on the intensity of the cropping so I looked at anything so that's where my pointer is if you can see it is about eight hundred dollars a ton and anything sorry eight hundred dollars per hectare per year um, as an average gross margin so anything that's up around that point generally has a cropping intensity of one. So you're getting one crop per year. So you have to have a double cropping option in there if you've got a rotation is one, two, three, four, five years and you've got five crops. So any with that cropping intensity of one is what's coming out in that top sort of area. And for the Liverpool Plains, that seems to be very similar to what we've found farming systems project. So much so that we even pushed it to 1.3. So we don't have any 1.3 rotations in here, but that's about the most you can get to. Um, it's a bit more risky. So I guess just because plots, you're probably fairly familiar with them, but the, as you can see, if we just take this first one, that, so they're, they're in reverse order here. So the darker blue is having um, a trigger of 200 mils water. So you have to have 200 mils of water in the soil before it will plant. Uh, the next one is 160 and the last one is 100. So generally you get less variability in yields when you have the more water, but you tend to have a slightly lower um, average yield. And, and the difference between um, and the way, the reason that's happening is that you're planting late, so you're not getting the maximum growth, uh, yield from each of the crops. 
So there is a, a penalty for planting late um, where you can see being a little bit more aggressive, you have more variability uh, in yield in a lot of them. Though it's quite surprising that a lot don't. It's pretty, you know, there's not a lot of difference between a hunt planting on 100 mils and planting on 160 for most of the rotations. And I think that's what I. The more aggressive you can get and the more comfortable you can be. Um, or having a lower trigger. It's a bit more risky, but it's not that much. So let's have a look at. Well, unless you've got some questions on that, we can have a bit of a look at um, how much risk people are ready, willing to take. Um, or I can pause for a second and rerun this to try and get that cotton price in. <laughs> um, so I yeah, don't know. I mean, that, that rotation with the cotton will change pretty well if if um, that price is up. If we put right, uh, so well, let's see if we can do it quickly. Um, you can't see what I'm doing here, but I'm just quickly trying to pull up the costs. Okay. Hang on a sec. I will show you exactly what I'm doing, so you can you can tell me the right prices. So we'll jump down to Liverpool. It's modelling. Yeah. Okay, so you wanted to change cotton. So about what eighteen hundred? Yeah, that well, make make it about sixteen sixteen eighty because that that'll be four hundred and twenty dollars a bale average. Uh, yep. That sort of accounts for a bit of discount in dry land, so thirty dollars a bale discount in dry land. So that'll be pretty close. Right, harvest costs are you fairly happy with those or? Uh, it's probably slightly low. Uh, it's probably closer to 280. Yep. Yep. That's the variable cost, so they don't include the harvest cost. Yeah, yeah, that's close. Yep. When you look at the others, that's pretty close. So, um, and and basically. Yep. And the final one is if you if you're only getting a bale, you may not. Yeah. Yep. That's that's okay. pretty good, already. Yep. Oh, save that. Oh, stupid thing. But, but uh, I might have to just do that again. Uh. I wasn't watching what it opened it in. Right, cotton eighteen. Two eighty. And we're happy. Okay. Now all go well. Close that. At the moment, it's ticking. So once it opens, it should update this picture that we're looking at. Um, so we can see whether it jumps. Unfortunately, it's only done 8%, so it will take a moment. Um, So, Bill, was there anything you wanted to ask about what? Um, 
I had a few questions about some of the on. I don't know if you want to, perhaps we should wait till then. Um, but yeah, it seemed to be, well, it seemed to be kind of wheat and sorghum and chickpeas seem to be pretty good. <laughs> if, if you want to just take general, very general kind of conclusions, yeah. Yeah, and so I guess one of the main things, oh, we're just about to update. So if I reload that. Okay. And not too good either. No, I was interested with the maze and one of the things that I, I have noticed with a lot of these rotations is the way I do the costs is each crop covers all the costs that proceed. To cover long fallows um, generally doesn't do as well as some of the others. So um, anyway, we can move on now because we've got cotton. Um, cotton's in there, so cotton has come up a bit there but not as much as you would have thought. Mm. Um, but it has it has jumped up pretty well to be, yeah, equivalent, sort of equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a purely a price. But so. Well, we'll see how it goes with, uh, uh, does that mean I've lost everything since I've updated? Bugger. Bugger. <laughs> okay. Luckily, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Oh, oh, what's happened over here? Let me. It, it seems to me that it was good to do that. Cotton's taken a lot of area down here in the last 10 years and yep. people just dis people discuss, you know, they talk about the hidden cost of cotton with the with the water use and length of time to refill the fallow. Yeah, and I think that So it is interesting. So I, I did have a look at look at this earlier this morning and think that I had to review my rotation. <laughs> what regard? Oh, it's just the cotton was way back, and I thought, oh, geez, I've made a bloody big mistake here. So it still looks as though I might have made a mistake. Yeah. Having cotton in the right place. That, that was sort of my thought when I looked at it. I thought, why has cotton become so popular? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's the, it's the carrot, that outlier. So. So if we look at yields, I guess that's probably one of the ways before you start hanging. I mean, the trouble is you should, it's always frightening just to look at, if you do this and you do continuous wheat or something like that, quite often continuous wheat will, will look pretty good. Um, yeah. But yep. we know it's not a good rotation. So, yeah, don't, don't, I wouldn't hang a sequence purely based on this. It, you've got to sort of put all this bit, these bits of information together. So at the moment, all I'm drawing from here is that if you plant a crop every year, you tend to do a bit better than if you um, 
plant less than a crop a year. So even this cotton one, you're you're planting a crop a year. So the actual crops are. So you've got three crops in three years with this cotton rotation, and it's basically the same as this five-year rotation, but five crops. So it tends to be a bit more on the intensity than the actual crop. I mean, cotton so, makes a lot of money in, in one. Sorry. Sorry. So what that's telling us is long fallows cost too much. Pretty much. Long fall. Yeah, long fallows do cost money. They're important, and they've got lots of additional benefits, many of which can't be captured in the model. So th this this rotation is only, you know, you've got chickpeas and wheat, which are going to give you some nematodes, but your long fallow and your cotton are going to help knock them out of the system, bring them back down. If we mm -hmm. go back up to this one, um, you know, the tendency might be to throw a mung bean crop in there, um, and that would give you that would shorten that rotation, but it would give you. Oh, no, it'd still be all right. I say, you're only you, this one would work pretty well with a mung bean sneaking in and out of that rotation only in the years that give you. You know, that have the opportunity to do so. Um, sorry, Bill. I'm do you think the model sort of? Um, so the model perhaps is not kind of crown rot and nematodes and those type of issues. Is um, what you're saying? It it doesn't take any consideration of disease. Yeah. So. So you have to look at it and, and yep. use disease as you. But I guess be, so before we so that's just giving us a, a rough idea of uh, um, process. Sorry, I'm getting distracted because I can hear the doorbell going, and I forgot to tell my wife that they're delivering the Christmas wine this morning. So anyway, well, you better go and get that. <laughs> if we look at this. Um, Looking at yields, I guess the thing I, I hope you guys were able to pick up that if you held your mouse over it, it'll give you the actual yield. And I was wondering whether you thought that the yields we were getting are um, fairly, you know, made sense to you. In my view, they probably should be a fraction higher than what you you would normally get as an average yield. Um, mainly because it's a, a model and we're presenting the water limited yield. Quite often what I do is count that yield by 20%. Um, that's basically what Svee Hockman's work shows that people um, tend to, you know, most growers tend to get 80% of the water limited yield potential, um, which makes sense because it costs a lot of money to actually get this last 20% where 80% um, of water limited yield potential is more a more sensible value. Um, so I can discount that if you reckon that would be more intuitive for people to look at. Um, but if they look fairly sensible to you as they are, we'll just leave. I, I think they look, looking they, look, on. they look pretty reasonable, I reckon. Yep. Yeah, yep. I looked through them the other day. Yep. I thought most of them looked okay. That yeah. cotton well, that's is good because is that tons per hectare, isn't it? So that's five by. That's right. Yes, of lint. Right. Yep. 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 No. So you would actually. Be... Uh, good. Now. I'll... It is always tricky because different areas, so a lot of the northern areas are getting closer to the yield potential, the water limited yield potential. And it's mainly because of our black soils and because people grow cotton, they put a
Okay. Oh, well, if you're happy with the yields, then we can look at the contribution of each crop. And we can see cotton is now contributing a bit more. <laughs> um, oh, that's wheat, sorry. Chickpea. Cotton. Cotton's gone green. I didn't realise that. Okay. Um, so it's probably the... It, wheat are the major contributors in that rotation, um, which probably makes sense as the chickpeas coming in as a, a double crop after cotton. Um, could be interesting to swap those around, whether you would, I suppose you want to have, uh, yeah, I see. You want to have wheat before the long fallow, don't you? But. Um, Means, means you have a fair bit of uh, bare soil with that, which will probably come out in some of the trade-offs. So I guess up, up to this point, we've looked at the, the gross margins, the yields, and the contribution of each crop to achieving those gross margins. Um, what these are are, are trade-off plots. Auto scale that. Okay. How many times do you have a full sequence with a negative gross with negative gross margins? So if your sequence is a three year se um, a three year sequence, we're saying during those whole three years, you haven't you've had a negative an overall negative gross margin. So it's fairly, um, yeah, you wouldn't expect too many to have that, but um, the maize one with barley and chickpea tends to have more, you know, there's about 40% of the time that it was, Disappeared. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're back. You're back. Yep. Sorry. I was asking whether that's what you'd expect that this rotation would is more risky and have a a higher failure rate than all most of the rest. Um, Longfellow mines barley. It. If if we're getting hotter, I mean, I've just I've got the situation now. We had maize planted in September, and it's tasseling. Yep. Um, and if it doesn't get rain in the next few days, it will be a negative gross margin. Yeah, yeah. So the heat and getting yep. rain at the right time is pretty critical for maize. And as we get hotter, I think that yep. you know that could be a thing. Yep. Yep. It quite certainly often, was surprised me often, that it was put. Sorry. Um, it surprised me, but when I look here, oh, that's the gross. Yeah, you know, three point eight tons for maize, first, and four tons for maize. Are they? They some of those seemed a bit low to me. Is, would they be low for your area, or? No, I, I reckon they. I mean, we grow five and six ton and seven ton dryland maize crops, but not lately. As an average, with some of right. the hotter summers and drier summers, yeah, yeah, that could be right. Yeah, yep. It's it's very time critical. You have got a ten day period to be not moisture, field, whereas with sorghum, it's probably not quite as that's what's critical in that yes. time period. Yep. So, I was yeah, just looking days. at it there. That seems to be about a ton, about a ton less than sorghum. Yeah. Yep. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yep. And see so that the. But is it? It's prime. Sorry. 
What's that? Sorry. Get to that point. I was going to say, is its price? Um, it, it's it's a bit it's higher than sorghum, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it is higher, but the cost of seed is a lot higher than sorghum. So, with corn, we're looking between eighty and a hundred bucks a hectare for seed. With sorghum, you're looking about forty. So that makes a big difference, I think. Yeah, I'm just looking at it here. We actually have only given it two hundred and fifty dollars at a medium price per ton. So would that be right, or should it be a bit higher? No, I reckon that's about right. Won't be far off. Yep. Is it okay. working while people don't grow corn? All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what I looked at next was working off that. So another way to to look at the risk of a sequence is to look at how well it does in the tough years, in the hard years. So we were trying to. So what I did is put. 20% of years. So I'll just scale that, try and make it a little sensible. Um, so here's the worst, how much you make with your sequence in the worst 20% of years versus how much you make on average. So rough eyeballing that cotton chickpea wheat rotation is the gives you the highest gross margin um, on average, but it's only giving you $250 in a bad season. Where if you come to a you close to $400 in a um, in the poor in a poor season where they're only giving six seven hundred dollars in a on an average so it's a bit of a trade-off you might be trading off a hundred dollars a year on average but you're making 250 dollars more in poor seasons so I guess that's it's a bit of a risk reward trade-off there so if you can't afford to have a have a poor year, then that 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 type. Way of looking at when you say a poor year, you mean actually. When you say uh, a poor year, you actually mean a poor year. You don't mean a poor sequence. Poor. Yes, sorry, that's well picked up, Bill. Um, I mean a poor sequence, so it is calculated on. Right. Um, so if it's a f yeah. if it's a three year sequence, it makes sense that yeah. um, even though everything is averaged back out, um, you will have more three year sequences in a period of time than you will have five year sequences in a period of time. So. Five years, you've got a greater chance of having a good year than in a uh, three year. So that's part of the trade off. But certainly, um, yeah. those, you know, it, it, it's an indicator of um, how well you will do in the worst period, in the worst period of time. Periods, yeah. yeah. So it's sort of getting very long term, isn't it? Yeah, so although we, we of can. Course, although, that. of course, you've got multiple paddocks with different, in different phases and different rotations, so I guess. That's right. Yeah. So the way I've analysed this, and it's it's a, a, a bit of a running argument at the moment, is all of these rotations. So we can show the results for every year for every crop in that year. So we can talk about the worst percent of actual years then. Um, I tend not to do it that way. I tend to do it going across 
the long years and do it in the full sequence, mainly because that allows you to relate it more tightly to rainfall. Um, because it's generally not the rain that falls in the year, it's the rain that's fallen previously in the fallow that benefits or. Yeah, it makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just think it's more accurate to analyse it, what we'd call longitudinally across the seasons. It, it means you don't get as much yeah. variability, but I, but I think it's more realistic. But I'm happy to be challenged on that if you guys think, because like I say, we're still trying to perfect the better way to look at it. Um, so that's that's one way of looking at risk. Another way to start looking at some of the environmental benefits or costs is to look at um, drainage and runoff. So how much water are you losing from the system um, and here you start, you're still, you're still consistently seeing you know, these higher rotations that have long fallows in them are towards the right hand side. So they, they're using, they're, they're a bit more leaky, um, but nowhere near as leaky as this one. So the, the cotton long fallow wheat is your most leaky but it also doesn't give you your highest gross margin. So you start wondering, is that rotation really worth it? Um, because you're losing a lot of water that you, you could use for producing another crop. And there. We're showing within the breezer, you know, we're only working through breezer at the moment. If you're showing within breezer, there is enough rainfall to sneak that, to get that one crop per year within the system or a ratio of one crop per year. I don't know if I looked at that the wrong way, maybe I did, but I sort of looked at that and said the higher soil, the higher triggers tended to be towards the left and to have less drainage and runoff. Yes. Where, where was I th there's a bit of a tendency for the higher drainage and runoff to be the, yeah, the, well, <laughs> it looks different now, so, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, so what I've done is just turn them off. I don't, didn't know yeah. you guys realised that, that you can, if you click on each of them, you can turn them off and look at them one at a time. So if we forget about the it, one. I did it once, but wasn't sure how I did it, yeah. Okay, no, that's all right. Um, so this is, this is the most aggressive plant where we're planting on 100 mils. And this is the most conservative where we're planting um, at are a little bit less leaky. Um, it's marginal. But, yeah. Um, Might accept and, it. It's marginal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's a, here's a good one. Let's look at these two. So there's definitely a bit of a a difference here. You're making more money with going a bit more aggressive because you're planting earlier. You're probably finishing earlier as well. Um, I would have expected, but this one, I guess, has more water in the system, so it can grow probably bigger crops. Yeah, but does it? It's counterintuitive. This it really needs to. I need to look at exactly what's happening there. Like you would have thought that the um, the ones that you wait longer for. Yeah, should be more should be more leaky and should um, or they grow bigger crops and therefore they would make more money. But they don't seem to be doing either. So it is an int I did look at it the other night and I was thinking I need to really explore that a bit more. Exactly. What it was a ground cover. Wondered if it was a ground cover thing. Uh, it could be. Yes, and that yeah. that would that would explain it. 
nicely in that if this was a grew more straw but not as not as much grain because it was planted planted late grew a lot of biomass but didn't get through to finishing in grain you know the hot weather coming in or especially this maize one you know whether you're losing because you do in the sim you will lose yield based on high temperatures um, so if that's happening you are getting more stubble but you're not getting the the dollars for it and yes that would help um, or it could be this one or the flip side of that would be that you're growing more material bigger crops which match with the extra gross margin therefore you've got better infiltration and more leaking out the bottom so that could also explain it thinking about it but yeah that's but I guess the main message for me from this is that um, you do have to have a little bit of leaky yeah it has to be, you have to have a you have to break a few eggs basically to make money so you do have to lose a bit of water um, and I don't think there's a problem with having a little bit of a leaky system because it means you do have a bit of a buffer within the system some of the stuff I'm doing in the southern rotations where we're doing um, early wheat and canola grazing them and then putting them through to grain so we're trying to keep basically March to November yeah. and the, deep, the deep rootedness we're worried about is that we're actually drying out the overall profile and the yields are tending to drop we haven't got evidence of it yet we've only got modeled stuff but we're trying to show that you, you you're removing the, any buffer from the system that little bit of extra water that sits in there okay so looking at nitrogen nitrogen you know if you, if you imagine you've pretty well got a apart from those ones you've got a bit of a line going across here that says the more nitrogen you put on the higher your uh, your returns I guess that putting a fair bit of weight on those chickpeas in there to help spare a bit of nitrogen with the long fallow um, it might be so we're only looking at the amount of nitrogen fertilizer applied in this case um, if we did a full nitrogen budget we'd probably find that this one was starting to mine existing nitrogen where this might be maintaining it because you're applying more nitrogen it yes, basically says that says that by their nature require more nitrogen tend to be more profitable yes so that, and that's probably getting back to the intensity business a bit too it is and looking at that rotation you're applying nitrogen so it's a one two so yeah it's a five crop in five years and one two three four of those crops have nitrogen applied so we didn't apply nitrogen before legumes but we applied it before every other crop and we basically took it up to 200 units so whenever the system was short of nitrogen it just got upgrade updated to 200 units of n so that's that's not a replacement strategy is it that is just we put on we put on x amount if it gets low we put on more is that right? yeah it it it's a bit like the nitrogen bank so it's basically saying we're going to try and keep 200 units of n in the soil yep. all the time so before we'll do a soil soil test before we plant and we'll fertilize up to 200 units yeah yep yep um, and it's another so that, way of sort of stating the old rule that nitrogen itself pretty well yeah so, so it, but it says it in a different way it says it in a different way but it kind of is the same sort of illusion yeah i would probably defer to elizabeth here because she's just 
the nitrogen bank. So, Elizabeth, feel free to jump in and correct me when I get it wrong. No, I think you're right there. It was, but it really depends on you not losing much nitrogen out of your soil. I had to top it up to that all the time. But yeah, the simulations that we did tended to be in the heavier soils. Uh, and yeah. it seemed to work pretty well. But yeah, you know, it needs to be field tested. Yep. Yeah. I guess the interesting thing for me is that we're still losing 110. Oh, sorry. We're still losing about 150 mils of water out of your, you know, within the 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 room. Yes, um, I think actually no, I think I brought that back to an annual, so that'll be 150 mils annually. So it's quite a lot of water mm. coming through the system. So it's either running off or or um, draining. So this was the, the final thing I put together, which is the marginal rate of return. Uh, so it's basically how much money do you get back for every dollar you spend? So I used it as a way of, I was trying to think about You have to spend a dollar to only get 20 cent, you know, to get 60 cents back, then you've actually got to have a much higher cash flow than if in these cases where you're spending a dollar and you're getting a dollar 40 back. So, um, so most of, so Breeze, I mean, we've worked through Breezer, which is probably the, the more, uh, I don't know, is it more, where would be the more marginal, or not marginal, but uh, less productive area out of the five, a six site we did? Yeah, I thought I thought Malali would be, but it was it was at, yeah. um, up there. Looking at, I'd say, just looking at it with the soil types, Karuna would be more marginal because it's got the highest less water. Okay. If we jump, we'll just jump straight to the Karuna trade-offs. Marginal rate. Yeah, it's still doing all right, isn't it? It is, there is a bit more back here. So if that must be about one there. I found this an interesting thing because when you start going out into, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of Mungandai, even Gundawindi, you've, you're really pushing to get up the um, costs that we're using are quite accurate for those for those regions and whether you know they have bigger farms and bigger machinery and we're we're actually our harvest costs and everything are, are too high but um, I'd like to sit and talk to some of the consultants out there to tr with in the same way as I'm talking to you guys to try and understand that a bit better yeah, and I think what you'll probably find out there, Jeremy, is they, they're pretty hard and fast on their planting rules, so they wouldn't yep. actually plant a crop if the moisture wasn't there. So uh, their marginal rate of return would be better because they don't, they don't actually plant that crop on the last day. So I'd say there'll be a fair bit in that. Yes, though it is surprising how that really can rock. So I have done some of that out there and it you, you tend to go from this uh, like a, a short fallow to a, an extra long fallow fairly quickly. You know, looking, yep. just waiting to get enough water. Um, that can actually cost the, fi the final crop quite a lot of money with all the sprays yep. that have gone on leading up to it. Yep. Um, so it's quite often that wheat, wheat and sorghum don't make. Right. And and doing more of the heavy lifting. 
and then you make your you make your money on the on the chickpeas or um, yeah, you're right. Uh, canola, canola or any of the other crops that get put in. Or well, the second wheat crop actually is the one that makes all the money, not the first. Yeah. yeah. Yep. 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 Um, so I found that quite an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. So I guess at this point it's up you to ask some more questions or have a look at some of the other sites. Or so I'm just I'm just start thinking about how we present this to growers and you know giving it yep giving it to the where we want to you know sort of take it. I'm just thinking of a table. I don't know whether yep. you can see that or not. Yep, hang on. So I'll just what I'm thinking you... is that... I've lost your sound, Pete. Oh, sorry, you there? Yep. Yep. Okay, so you, what I'm thinking is that that sort of box spot that you've got there, if it has crosshairs yep. through the middle of it, and then we look at say so up here I've got better better so we want to be aiming for that box rather than this one down here which is both work so it just might show it up for growers a bit easier of where to look or where to aim um, so that yeah we should so, be sort of trying to put the better option in the top right rather than you know sort of swapping them around so let's take let's go back to that that runoff one drainage and runoff instead of having 160 yep. mils on the right hand side can we swing that to the left hand side that we're so we're always looking at that top right hand side as being where we want to aim for so right so you all so, saw a water there we had 150 should be going from 150 to zero and then have the gross margin in the top left so that so that we all always your preferred option is in that top top right sorry not top left top right corner yep. of your box yeah it just might help growers focus where where the the better option would be is what i'm thinking yeah yeah no that that makes sense and it's um I mean, the big thing that we we don't really want to do is start saying that one oh, sorry, you just dropped again, go again others, but you've sort of got to look at them all like we've done, but I, I see your point, like it would be good to highlight you know this one's the winner here. And then trace it all the way through as to see does it win everywhere else? Yeah, okay. Yep, yep. Good point. But I, yep. I agree with your splitting it, you know, putting a line across here and a line down here. Yeah. So, that, you know, especially if that's, you know, just to highlight which is the best quarter to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, yep, no, I think we can do something like that. If you want to take a snapshot of your uh, your your diagram and shoot it to me at some stage, that'd be cool. Just yep, no guys. Yep. Um, should we present? Should we present all the rotations? Could we have too many there? Not, I'd hazard a guess that you do. Yeah, I think you do. Um, there's a lot here that are pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. I counted 51 there, which does seem a lot. Yeah. yeah. Need to do all the soil. So they're basically repeated with the two different triggers, mm. uh, three different triggers. Um, that's probably not necessary. I mean, it, we could show it to show that there's, you know, looking here, there's not a lot of difference between 
planting on 100 mils and planting on 200 mils. So, you know, if, if you can wear a bit of, um, a little bit of risk, there's a bit, a little bit of risk of planting um, on, on, a, on, on 100 mils, but, you know, you're not getting a great deal of safety by planting on 200. Yeah, yeah. But then you've, you've got to come back to your marginal rate of returns and things like that. Because that, you know, if you're, if you're going to spend a dollar, you don't want to be making, you don't want to be making 50 cents, you want to be making a dollar fifty. So, having all of those in there. Yeah, but if we look. Um, there we are, sorry, marginal rate of return. Um, right, so if we compare that one and that one, yeah, it improved it. Yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yep, yep. So, I don't think, I, getting... I don't think need to see that. So, to drop, to drop out, yes, you know, as planting yeah. things, I think people need to see that type of thing. Does that surprise me? Yes, and to think that it'd be even more so if you had a strict rule. So if you had a strict rule that said, if I don't get 200, I'm not planting at all, um, you would, I reckon you would suddenly see a whole lot of dark blue dots back around one. Because you... Yeah. Because you'd suddenly go from that one crop a year um, uh, intensity, you would. Then you keep that, yeah. So that next crop would carry crops. the cost. Yeah. yeah, but if you forget about the actual crops and start looking at these, so this one, this is a, a 50, uh, what's that, 75% sequence. Even its extremes aren't getting to the mean of the crop a year. Yep. So I think one of the things I've learned from doing some of this is you know, everybody gets, and it's an argument I'm having with the guys in the South, they get all hung up on individual crops. And sometimes I don't think it's as, I appreciate certain crops make more money than really? others but you know yeah, if you so don't have a wheat if you, you don't have a wheat crop yeah so if you don't have a wheat crop in the system you're not getting enough water in to grow chickpeas or canola anyway so it might not make you as much money as a cotton crop but you can't grow a cotton crop without it so yeah yeah um, how flexible is it I'm just thinking about that wheat, cotton, wheat, sorghum, sorghum rotation. How flexible is the modern the model to say, well, if we don't get the moisture to plant cotton, we plant sorghum in that place instead? And yep. how flexible is it to say we set, a, we set our 60 mil for chickpeas, we don't get it, and we don't plant that crop, so we just carry through to the canola after it? Is that, Can, yes, you can do that? that. Yep. So this is where I thought you guys might get to that. We might just pick, if we just pick about three or four sequences, we can start yep. doing more complex things. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that on 20 odd rotations because. No, 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 no. no. Should I, that be, should I, should. I, should. This is this is our first step. So I believe that yep. one's probably the next step because that's in yep. reality what people start to do. They say, Well, I don't have the moisture for this crop. What fits in there that doesn't upset my rotation too much? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of think you present what what you've got to the group and then yeah, just right. talk about talk about that must plant rule and then go into the next step which will be yeah if if we don't get the moisture till the last day then 
hold over kind of thing and do something else. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to do that, we yeah. yeah. So to do that, we have to start developing some quite strict rules. So this cotton chickpea wheat. part of the rotation because you've got to get some cover. I'll just shut my window. You might be, we got a good tropical storm happening out there at the moment. Um, so if, if you make the rule that you're going to plant that wheat anyway, no matter what, just to get some cover, um, you could, you'll go for the long fallow because you will have a summer crop after a long fallow and that could either be cotton, it could be maize or it could be sorghum. And you can depict, you can specify rules what it is. Um, you've got the chickpea, you're still going to put chickpea in or are you thinking that you'll jump chickpea and go straight to wheat as a, if there's well, not. That, that's probably, that's where I was going to say, that's probably the the flexible point that rotation, if you don't have the moisture for chickpeas, it doesn't go in. So you just carry it around the long fellow wheat. Yep. Okay. So you can have, that won't be too hard to do. So you'd have, so you've got an alternatives for cotton and then you just have a flex of chickpeas either in or out. Yeah. When we go to that flexible phase, if you like, we'll, higher moisture triggers start to look better, do you think? Because, because you won't be forced to plant a crop at the end of the winter and suffer a poor yield from late planting day. The further west you go, I think that's right. What we found, so I have done this, exactly what you've just asked for. Um, and I've actually done it for Breezer, so I can, I think I showed it last time, but we probably didn't pick it up because there was so much that we covered. Um, what it, what it does show is that, um, in a large you sort, of, you sort of get to a point where there's uh, having a, a soil water trigger, the more water you have, the, the more yield you get, and the more money you make, and then you top out at a point where it starts costing you money to wait to get that extra bit of water. Yeah. Um, I think I've made the comment, unfortunately, they're going to publish it in, a, in ground cover where I've, I've said, you know, waiting for a full profile can cost you money, but you have to wait for an adequate profile. So you only, you want to make sure that so that you can get a good good yield, a great yield every now and then. Um, yeah. So as long as you're making what you say about every it. year, yeah. Is this trade-off with intensity? I mean, some people take it to being stupid, and they'll—you've got to plant on enough water that's going to give you a a good return. So in the north, you know, you know, looking at this, I'd say anything above a hundred mils is worth planting. When you start getting, and probably towards the eastern side, you can slide that back to eighty, but you know. I tend to work in 50 mil jumps. So if you've got 50 to 100, that. But if you anything above 100 mils, you can start planting, um, you know, sorghum, um, probably your wheats and your chickpeas. But as you start getting into more expensive crops again, like cotton, you might push for a bit a bit more of the 150 160 mil but that's the sort of thing that this ne next analysis will test so if we only have a couple of um, 
you know, maybe one or two rotations, then you can do it with lots of different water triggers. Yeah. But the likelihood is that in the east, those different triggers won't make a big lot of difference. That would be my feeling, but yeah, yeah it all depends how the rain falls. Um, even even at Walgett, I remember <clears throat> playing with water triggers, and you know, when people started trying to get a bit cute and say, "Oh, well, we'll just do 120 or whatever." It tended to come out that if you got a hundred, you got, you sort of got about a hundred and fifty. Like it, it, you either have a hundred and fifty and nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um. Eighty nine. It's not going to plant. Where in reality, yeah. you would. So that's always, you know, models are very cut and dry. Um, yeah. But using the historic record, you will get quite an indication of how often you would plant. Another question might be, you know, what's the difference between all those sites we've done, you've done? Yeah. And how much geographic difference is there? How much do we need to present on geographic, geographically different data? Or yeah, I thought about that. I mean, uh, you know, I guess. Do you really want to see whether breeze is different to Corindai or Prima? I mean, we can do that. We could just pick one of these rotations and look at it. You know, put them side by side. All the that's not it's not hard to do. Um, I'm just not sure how much benefit it would be if you, you know, well, you are this, where you are. Think, I don't think there's a huge amount of difference in that. Um, it's probably the biggest difference is just the water. So if we picked this higher and lower soil water, that would probably show a lot more difference. Yes. Different soils for each we, site would certainly change things. Do we need for the so, next meeting to present all the sites and then see if we can get a consensus maybe to reduce the sites? Yeah, I, I think you're right, Bill. Yeah. At some point, because of the complexity that we're going to get to, we're going to have to drop out some of those things because we just can't keep expanding, expanding, expanding on what we want to achieve because it'll just get too complex. Yeah, so as, as you've seen, you know, I was just going to say, as you've seen, we've taken an hour and we've basically got through Breezer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's... I think it's people do need a bit of convincing Sorry, Bill. Yeah. You go. People need a little bit of convincing that their patch isn't different to 50 k's down the road. That's that's always been a, how it is in agriculture. Probably got a little yeah. bit. I, I, I think initially, everybody needs to see what we're seeing here. We go through mm, one, yeah. and then they go through their own situation individually. Because if you try and cover everything in a meeting, you're just not going to be able to do it. So you got to leave it in the, somebody else's court to go and do their own research. Yeah, I mean, the other bit is that we can go through one. I mean, you're thinking doing this with the growers or with all the uh, consultants initially? I think, I think that original group to start off with. And then, and then we can take it to a grower level. And we're probably, yep. you know, realistically, we probably should leave it up to the individual consultants to take it back to their growers. Their own spin -off. So, 
So what I was thinking is that we could pick one of these. I mean, I picked Breezer just because it was the first one, but we can go through one of the others. Um, and then we could just open it. You know, if we've sent it to everybody first, and they would yeah. have gone through their own, They can. we can just field questions on any of it. Yep. yep. I, I think like what you've done here, though, to work through one whole thing, explaining runoff, internal rate of return, all that sort of stuff. I mean, most people know it, but just to explain how it all works and how it falls in is good. Yep. Um, because, you know, I looked at this this morning and thought, you know, I had a few answers and then all of a sudden I'm thinking differently now. So, um, yeah, I, what do you reckon, right. Bill? I, yeah, I tend to agree. I think perhaps we need to probably present most of this and then maybe um, Perhaps in the presentation, Jeremy needs to drop in a few of those comments about, say, the geographic differences or about the lack of difference between triggers yeah. and just try and walk the group towards um, the next step, which might be doing um, not having 51 scenarios but having less scenarios where we, we, yeah, with more complexity, where you drop that must plant rule. Yep. Um, and yeah, perhaps we need to talk about that must plant rule and some of the, some of the compromises that that entails. Yeah, some of the issues that that raises. And yeah. So what might be what able to do, think, depending on where, Yep. Sorry, you've, done a lot, you've done a lot more of this than I have. What would you think about just doing like a video presentation like we have done here for the agronomist and then six weeks later, something like that, get a, get a heap of growers in a room and, and go through it? Does that work? Um, yeah, it could. Um... I was thinking that whether it would be better to to actually have a a face to face with the consultants since yep. it's been a year. That was that was all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. The risk could be that nobody watches the video because they say, "Well, I'll just go and see Jeremy down at Nally in a few." You know what I mean? In six weeks. Uh, yeah, but then they won't they won't have the benefit of this the individual. They they'll be just stuck with the rest of the group. So I, I agree, Bill, but if it's a video conference, it's a bit more achievable rather than two full meetings. That's what I'm yeah. sort of thinking. Yeah. yeah. Just a bit, bit easier for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I'm happy to do either. Pete, I'd really whichever you... I'd be really keen to sit this in front of some crowd. Um, yeah, look, I'm happy to fit in with, with you guys. You guys know your, your growers and consultants and everyone. You'll know. What do you think, Bill? Um, I'm a little bit confused. So you're saying Jeremy presents, does a video presentation on... What we've just done here this morning. Yep. For that original group that was at Nowley. Yep. And then we do a bigger meeting where we get growers in a room and show them. Oh. Because uh. I, I, think, I think this will generate a huge amount of discussion in, amongst growers. Yeah, I guess my thought is that from all that discussion, we need to then extract some plan going forward. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and we'll just need to make sure that that uh, doesn't cost yeah a huge amount of discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, like we've just done here, the next step will be you know, we drop crops in and out, we cut the right number of rotations down. That that level of discussion happens with the agronomists or that original group, and the growers. While they're able to ask questions, they don't get to determine. They don't get to determine what's in and out next time. That that's up to the group of the agronomists. So, so that way, that okay, so we can we can leave that round meeting saying, now our next step will be, we're going to drop chickpeas out of that cotton cotton chickpea wheat rotation and see what that does, or we're going to. We're going to put this over a wider range of soil types or something like that. Yeah. So then the only so question right. is when do, when Sorry, do we okay. make that? So the question would then be when do we um, when do we make that decision with the smaller agronomist group? Do we do that at the physical meeting before the growers arrive, or I, I do we so. do it? Just a video meeting, so that nobody's got to travel, yep. and you know it's just an yep. hour, hour and a half. And then we say, yep. you know, where do we take this next? Yeah. Okay. We present this step where we're at now to the growers. And we can tell the growers, inevitably, there'll be questions of, well, I don't want to plant that crop there. What if I do this? You can say, ah, well, that's our next step. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, right, so the future. That? Yeah, I think that sounds plausible. So the future scenarios are decided at that video meeting, video conference, yeah. video yeah. call, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, sounds yeah. plausible. Yeah. I mean, if there's an uh -huh. absolute gem that's come out of the grower group, we can, you know, adopt that. But <laughs> chances are yeah. we're, going to, we're going to think of everything they're going to think of. Yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds reasonable. What do you reckon, Jeremy? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Look, I think we can do that, man. It's hopefully there'll be a bit more travel happening next year, and if things go the way they are. Or the way they're planned, I'll be down around your way a little bit. I've been allowed to be this year, so there is always option for face to face. But yeah. um, I mean, to me, it, you know, using the, the video conference power is quite good in that we can get people in quickly, have conversations, cover a bit cover quite a bit and whether you just do it more regularly with shorter time points so people get used to just coming in for an hour doing yep. it. Yep. Yep. Benny. Would that, yep. Would that be so, yeah. preferable for you? Uh, it probably is easier. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. Be easier because you're just not you're not wasting time travelling. But yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's what I'm trying to get at is trying to cut down the number of trips people are going to do so that you know we haven't got to rely on borders being open or you know you come down here for a day and it's three days gone. So yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to avoid. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, it, we can do it in two days. That's what I did earlier this year. So it's basically fly down one day, do it in the morning as long as we're back in Brisbane. 